Well, good morning and welcome to a new year and part two of our new series, Getting the Worth Out of Life. We began this series last week by talking a little bit about how we've all had a pretty rough year, you know, with everything that's been going on. And it's been so challenging, in fact, that many of us have been having a really tough time considering any kind of New Year's resolution during a season where it's very much our tradition to make changes to our lives so that we can get the most out of life. But traditions or not, I mean, why would any of us be thinking about getting the most out of life when a whole lot of us are just trying to come up with ideas how to get anything out of life right now? So as I was wrestling with this personally, I did what I often do, and I went to my Bible and I opened it up to the book of Ephesians, which, as I mentioned last week, uh, is a letter from the Apostle Paul that he wrote while he was under house arrest in isolation, kind of going through something that was probably an awful lot like what we're going through right now. Anyway, in that letter, he said something that takes this idea of getting the most out of life and opens it up to something so very much bigger. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 1, Paul says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And when I read that, it hit me. We don't need to be talking about how to get the most out of life, because getting the most out of life really just focuses on ourselves. At, this, at its core, it's selfish and it's self-centered, because it's all about satisfying and gratifying me. It does nothing to improve about myself. And I believe that we don't just want to have better, we want to be better. So in this series, we're going through the book of Ephesians and unpacking some of the things that Paul wrote while in isolation that show us a little bit more about how we get the worth out of life. Now today, I want us to take a look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, where it says this, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Now, some translations say that uh, by our very nature, we were children of wrath. Now, I want to stop here just for a bit because I really kind of want to talk about what we just read. You see, it's important to recognize that the language Paul uses here is in the past tense. Once you were dead, you used to live in sin. All of us used to live that way. By our very nature, we were children of wrath. And, and this is really important because as we talked about last week, it's not just about what we think or what we believe, it also has a whole lot to do with who we are in Christ. Because who we are determines an awful lot about how we will live. Now last week, we talked about our adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, which is this huge idea about the reality that we are not who we once were. We have been adopted by the Father into his family, and we are told in his word, in the Bible, that when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So what's important to see here in this first part of Ephesians 2 is that although Paul doesn't exactly spell it out for us, what he does do in speaking very intentionally about the things we used to be is once again call attention to the fact that we have a new identity in Christ. We're a new creation, and we're living new lives. We're no longer, you know, these things anymore. We don't live this way anymore. We're no longer children of wrath, because we're now children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, more than just being in the past tense, the language that Paul uses here in chapter 2 of Ephesians is also active. It's, it's alive. They're action words. You were dead uh, because of your disobedience. You, know, you, 
used to live in sin. All of us used to live that way. We were following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. We were subject to God's anger. So he's not talking about our thought life or necessarily the, the impression we used to give people. He's talking about the way we live. He's talking about the things we did. He's talking about how we engaged the world as compared to how we live it now. That matters because we must know that it's not enough to simply understand these truths. We're meant to live them. As James reminds us, faith without works is dead. And I kind of like the expanded version that we find in the Living Bible where it says it like this. Fool, when will you ever learn that believing is useless without doing what God wants you to? Faith that does not result in good deeds is not real faith. That's super heavy, right? I mean, that's just, I read that and I go, oh. So it's it's not enough to just know these truths, to, to have them up here in our head. We have to get past our heads and into our hearts. We must be living them. And I think that's at least part of the point that Paul is making here. He's reminding us of where we came from, who we used to be, to remind us of who we are now, reminding us of how we're meant to be living now. By reminding us of how it used to be, how poorly we were living, how desperate the situation we were living in, by reminding us of those things, he reminds us of something so powerful, so beautiful, so wonderful, should take our breath away. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. But God. These two words may be the biggest and most powerful two words put together in all the scriptures. But God. These two words together here, like this, say so much more than any other two words I can think of. They speak about redemption, yours and mine. They're connected to every once broken life. In these two words are found all the stories of salvation from every corner of the world, from every moment in time. These two words speak infinitely about love and grace and mercy and the power of his goodness in this world. And no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter who you may have hurt in this life or who may have hurt you, no matter what your life has looked like up to this very moment, these words have been spoken across time and space for you. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. 
Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You know, this is one of my very favorite passages of Scripture. You see, what, what follows the but really takes all of the unnecessary pressure off. It destroys any idea that it might be about what I'm capable of. Because let's face it, I'm only capable of so much. And the same is probably true for you. This was so incredibly freeing for me. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this was huge. You see, I've had many successes in my life, which is a good thing. But I've also messed up a lot in this life. I have messed up so much, I can't even keep track of it. I mean, even a whole bunch of the stuff that I'm actually pretty good at, I found out had some pretty strong limitations. Take running, for example. When I was a kid, I was still in elementary school. I wasn't super fast, but I could run for a really long time. So each year at our school's track and field event, I would enter all the long distance races. And I would do all right. In fact, I did pretty well. Maybe I'd place third, I might place fourth, but I could never quite get first place. So I, I did what anybody wanting something would do. I practiced, and I practiced, and I practiced. But I could never quite get there. See, even though long distance running was kind of my thing, I couldn't quite make it to first place no matter how hard I tried. Because the truth is, my strength and my endurance and all of my capabilities, whatever they may be, they all have some limitations. And so do you with yours. We were all made differently. Some of us are better at some things than others are, and some of us have more strength than others. Some people are smarter than other people. But the point is, we are all uniquely made with different strengths and different giftings, and God knows that. That's why heaven and being made right with God and salvation itself have nothing to do with what we're capable of. It's all about what he's capable of. So no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what choices you've made, or even how your life looked when you rolled out of bed this morning, no matter what your life has looked like even up to this moment, these words have been spoken across time and space for you. But... God. And this matters so much because often we as human beings tend to take too much onto ourselves. And when we think everything is up to us, like if it's going to work out, it's going to work out because I put in enough effort, because I was smart enough, or because I tried hard enough. And the further we fall into darkness in this life, the harder it is for us to imagine things like love, acceptance or forgiveness, let alone that the creator of the universe would call us his masterpiece. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, when this whole journey of faith started, I didn't feel like a masterpiece. I mean, I was pretty broken, I mean, with a capital B. I was, I was foul-mouthed and angry about everything. I had been cruel to people. I had betrayed friends of mine. I had been living a pretty self-centered and wasted life for a long time. So even after, I don't know, a few years I'd been around, a few years after I'd come to Jesus, I still remember the time when I was sitting at the dining room table with my wife, Tracy, talking about our future. And in the middle of the discussion, she looks at me and she says, you know, you'd make a really good pastor. And I laughed out loud at her. But it really wasn't very funny. You see, she was sincere in what she said. And I still believed that success in my life 
is up to me. But God. Can you imagine if our salvation or sanctification or even getting into heaven was really about how well we behaved in life? I mean, really. Can you imagine what that would be like? Who would measure up? I mean, would you just have to do more good things than bad things? Kind of like, I don't know, balancing a scale? What if, what if you were really good most of the time, like better than most everybody else, and you only really did like one really bad thing in your life, but it happened to be something like you killed your little brother for breaking your favorite toy? I mean, how would that work out? Is there a scale for that? Or what if it wasn't about your behavior, but rather it was about something else, like, like it was a test you had to take to get in, kind of like an IQ thing? I mean, I'm sure my dad would have all the answers, but would I be smart enough to get in? What kind of questions would be on that test? And if only smart people get in, then what would happen to all the warm-hearted loving people who couldn't pass the test. I mean, think about it. Honestly, if, if being made right with God or, or getting into heaven or even salvation itself were up to us and what we're capable of, who could measure up? That's why this but is so important. But God, See, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how good you've been in life or, or how bad you've been in life. It doesn't matter how smart you are or how talented you are or brave or creative or anything else. What matters is your faith and letting God do what he does so that we can be who he designed us to be. God saved you by his grace when you believe, and you can't take credit for this, it is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So what do we do about all this stuff? I mean, it's not like this passage is a play-by-play -play instructions of godly living. But as I pointed out earlier, often when we read a passage of Scripture, what's being said points to something more. In this case, when Paul says that we used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, then we understand that we are to no longer live this way as followers of Jesus. Do you still have sin in your life? I mean, is there is there something you've been struggling with or, or something that's been wearing you down in your faith? If there is, you can be free from that. And you don't have to worry about whether you're strong enough or good enough or anything else like that because it's not about what you can do. It's about what he can do in you, and through you. When Paul talks about how we used to obey the devil, refusing to obey God, then we understand that now, as followers of Jesus, we should be seeking God's will for every area of our lives. Does that sound like how you're living? Are you looking and listening for God's will in every area of your life? Are you challenging yourself to read the Bible and discover more of what he wants for you? The truth is, you may feel like that's a, it's an awful lot to take on. It may even seem overwhelming at times, because let's face it, the, you know, a lot of the stuff that God asks us to be and live can seem really huge and unattainable at first. But God has made a way. He is your strength. He has your answers. He knows the way, so you'll never get lost. Watch, listen, and follow. Be where he is, doing what he's doing, 
And if your life ever seems like it's all too much and you're not sure how to handle it, just remember these two words. But 